name is John. Uh, you had some unkind words earlier for the state of scholarship in the US. Um, and in particular, in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a growing wave of delegitimization and uh, I guess assault on academic freedom, particularly. Of? Uh, assault on academic freedom. Uh, oh, attack on it. For on Middle East studies, yeah. uh, scholars of Islam, and uh, international relations scholars. So I was wondering if you could comment on that and uh, the possibilities for uh, people in the academy to fight back. So the issue is the, the attack on academic freedom, especially in, with relate to, to Middle East studies. And yeah, that's, that's real. I'm not sure how new it is, frankly. It's been going on for a long time. Uh, the, uh, so, so Middle East studies, for example, is quite different from, say, Latin American studies. They compare the two professional associations. In the case of the Latin American Studies Association, uh, I mean, typically, when the U.S. You know, carries out atrocities somewhere or invades some country or whatever, uh, what the press does is go to the local university and get an expert who can be uh, confidently assumed to preach the government line. Okay, that's, for example, what mostly happened in Vietnam. It happens in Israel all the time. Easy. Latin American studies, they couldn't do it. Uh, when U.S. atrocities began to mount in Latin America through the 60s, ending up with horror stories in the 80s, uh, the Latin American Studies Association would not provide the ideological support. I mean, a few did, but most didn't. In fact, they condemned the actions. There were people who really cared about the countries where they were. So the uh, media had to invent a new cadre of uh, apologists couldn't go to the local university, I'll go through the details if you like, but they picked a series of people who became, you know, were, were designated to be spe experts, nothing there, and they gave the official line. So then the press could appear to be neutral, you know, they're just going to experts. Uh, Middle East studies has never been a problem. You can always get Bernard Lewis, and, you know, the rest of them. Uh, you can turn to the, the Washington Institute of Near East Policy, it's an offshoot of APAC, which the press pretends they know better, is an independent scholarly agency and so on and so forth. Uh, it's been there for a long time. There are also now, uh, now that, uh, I, I, I don't want to say it's, a, it's, a, it's not exactly what happened with South Africa, but there are similarities. And now that popular opinion is very notably uh, turning against Israeli crimes, not against U.S. Israeli crimes, because that aspect is suppressed, but it should be that. But what they're turning against Israeli crimes, there's a, a growth of uh, organizations trying to uh, beat it back and denounce it and condemn it, like the David Project, for example, and others. You know, their goal is to try to suppress any discussion of these issues. You couldn't do that in the case of South Africa because there was no support for apartheid. You know, you couldn't, I mean, maybe you could do it in the John Birch Society or something, but in major sectors, there was essentially no support for apartheid. Uh, in this case, it hasn't gone that far by any means, but opposition is growing, notably. I mean, look, I've given talks on this topic in Brandeis uh, for many years. Uh, back in the 90s, when I tried to give a talk on this issue, the meeting was just broken up, literally. You know, uh, students would get up and scream, and, you know, have to stop the meeting. And in fact, I remember one talk, must have been 95 or so, when uh, I was talking about these issues, but the protests were so violent, and uh, the, 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 I had one friend who was in the back of the room, an Israeli actually, you know, served in the Israeli army and so on. He tried to break up the, the, he was called on to ask a question, and he tried to sort of turn it back to something sensible, so he asked a sensible question. But the audience started screaming at him, you know, Bogued, you know, traitor, you know, you can't do that, you know, got to scream and have tantrums. Uh, that was in the mid-90s. I remember another talk a couple of years ago where it wasn't that bad, but there was literally airport security. You couldn't get into the auditorium without opening your bag, you know, 
pocketbook, your backpack, whatever it might be, and getting inspected. Well, today, you know, some people walked out. It's, it's a big change, and that changes all over the country. I mean, there, I, mean I can give you details. I, mean, I, used, I used to literally have police protection at major American universities if I was giving a talk on this issue. That's, I know half the cops in Cambridge because they had to come to <laughs> meetings. You know. But that's, that's all gone, and it's a sign of the substantial change in attitudes. In fact, you know, by, by now it's extremely hard to get a hostile question. It used to be impossible to get anything but diatribes. Well, okay, with, with that change, which is very visible, uh, there's an attempt to beat it back. And that's, I think, what you're talking about. Just partially it's been successful, but not too much, actually. There are a few cases which are deplorable, but uh, by and large, I think it's been held in check. Professor Chomsky. Hi, I'm Jason Olson, a um, PhD student in the Near Eastern Judaic Studies. Um, you're, I, I've heard a lot of things about you, but I'm, I, was, I was very uh, relieved to know that you're correct about uh, on many of your facts. Um, one one uh, question, comment that I wanted to pose to you, and, and to, uh, I know you haven't had a chance to explore it much, but uh, on Christian Zionism, I, there's two trends. Um, you're right about this Christian apocalyptic Zionism. There's also Christian humanistic Zionism, Absolutely. which comes from historical guilt stemming from Christian anti-Semitism. And there is, uh, you know, Jews as chosen people wanting to support Israel to prevent Jewish deaths. Um, and I'd like you to, I, I want to know if you've explored Christian humanistic Zionism and how you see it as a role in, in uh, helping the peace process. Well, who, who did you have in mind specifically? Uh, there, there's there's pockets of there are pockets of, of Christians yeah. United yeah, Israel um, other yeah uh, I mean sure yeah, I understand historically yeah. informed intellectual Christians yeah the, I mean uh, sure I mean, there's uh, when you talk about the rise of fundamentalism say Islamic fundamentalism you can say the same thing I mean, there are pockets of it that have a humanistic uh, origin and drive but if you look at the general phenomenon I think as a what I said is a pretty good first approximation. And it also reaches all the way to high places, like to the presidents, to the White House. I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, George W. Bush was part of this. Uh, in this would have been January 2003, when Bush was trying to get uh, support from Western powers for the invasion of Iraq, uh, he met with the uh, um, the French president, Chirac, and he started, uh, he, uh, to he started what Chirac took to be raving about, he started uh, uh, citing passages in Ezekiel, very obscure passages which nobody understands. There's a passage in Ezekiel about Gog and Magog, you know, coming from the north and doing terrible things. Nobody knows whether Gog and Magog are people or places or what they are, but they play a role in sort of this Christian, you know, eschatology. Uh, the way I found out about this was from a Belgian theologian who sent me a disquisition that he wrote on this passage from Ezekiel with a message saying he had sent it to the French government and I sort of worked it out, and it's been verified in biographies of Chirac and so on. What happened is Chirac didn't understand what this maniac was talking about. <laughs> so he asked the uh, foreign office, the LSA, you know, what's, what's this guy raving about? And they didn't have any idea. So they approached this Belgian theologian, well-known Belgian theologian, who gave him a long description of, you know, the passage and what it's meant. and ultra-right, you know, extremist Christian thought and so on. But Bush evidently believed it. And in fact, if you go back to Reagan, his handlers kept him pretty well under control. But in the cases where he got off by himself, he started talking about these things. I mean, I think this is, uh, you know, how serious it is, I don't know. But it's, it's a big part of American culture, and it's, uh, 
It's very, very effective. I mean, there is Christian humanism, certainly, but I don't think, I think Christian humanism is in the, uh, you know, you find it, say, in the National Council of Bishops, who are critical of uh, U.S. Israeli policies. That's Christian humanism. I mean, the idea that you'd support Israel to save Jews is very strange, because the Israeli government doesn't try to save Jews. I was pointing out that they follow policies which prefer expansion to security. Now, they're not unique in that. That's pretty common among states. The mythology is states don't want to protect their citizens. It's certainly not true. I mean, take, say, the invasion of Iraq. I mean, the invasion of Iraq was undertaken with the expectation that it was going to increase terror. And that was what the intelligence agency said, both British and American, that's what specialists said, and so on. And it happened much more than was expected. In fact, terror increased by a factor of seven after the invasion of Iraq, way beyond what was expected. But that's pretty typical of state behavior, and Israel's no exception. And if you look, I mean, they could have security right now. You know, if you want to save Jews, fine. Accept the international consensus. No, security, everybody agrees. But that's not state behavior. Uh, and I think the, if there are groups that think they're helping save Jews by supporting Israeli policies, I think they're pretty misguided. They have to look at the history and the current situation. But yes, you're right, they're there. I don't think they're the major force. I should say there are other reasons to explore, if we're serious about it, about why you have popular support for Israel. And a lot of these reasons are not very pretty. I mean, there are reasons having to do with, you know, strategic analysis and so on and so forth. But I think one fundamental reason, uh, which I don't think has been explored much, is that the United States is a settler colonial society. A settler colonial societies are absolutely the worst form of imperialism because it means you wipe out the indigenous population. I mean, you know, there were people living here before the colonists came from England. They're gone. And they were gone because that was the will of God. There's a streak of what's called providentialism, which runs right through American history from the founding fathers right up till today, which says, whatever we do, it's God's will. And uh, I could run through the details, they're interesting, but this says when the colonists came, uh, they came in order to help the Indians by exterminating them. And then you get commentary, you know, by Supreme Court justices and people who said, it's kind of strange. We came here to help them, but they're uh, withering away like the leaves of um, autumn, you know. Well, God's ways are mysterious. Uh, and uh, you, we can't, uh, uh, this is a deep streak of American history. And they, well, many people just intuitively see Israel as re reliving it. And that, that's intensified by the fact that you remember the United States was settled by religious extremists. These were people who were waving the holy book while they were calling themselves the children of Israel, you know, coming uh, to the promised land and you have to exterminate the Amalekites, you know. I mean, that goes right from the beginning of American history, right up to the present. And I, I don't know how to measure it exactly, but I suspect that that's part of the sort of cultural background for intuitive support, not pretty but uh, imperial conquest never is, and settler colonialism is the worst. <laughs>